Good morning again and welcome. This is so exciting and I'm so glad that so many people could be here. Because I didn't know how this would go and everyone's here and this is great. And I'm so glad we sang that last song because it's such a great prayer just for God to speak to us and for his word to change us. And so that is the prayer that uh, for this morning. So if you'll see on your chairs, you should have a little booklet. And that is something that is kind of like an outline that will follow along with what I'm going to say. Uh, well, there's a schedule at the front and then you can see it jumps kind of in. So there's extra room to take notes. Please take notes and jot things down. And um, most of the scriptures are in here as well because we're going to jump around a little bit. So um, if you have your Bibles, you can open them. If not, I should. I hopefully have all the scriptures in here for you as we go along. Um, so you can follow along there with us. Um, now, when I was a teenager going to church, I remember, I hate to say, feeling kind of bored if the preacher got up and I knew it was going to be another sermon about the gospel. And I thought, oh, I already know this. Like, can't they tell me something more practical and helpful for me to grow in my walk with the Jesus, with my walk with the Lord? I thought, I already know that. I'm already saved. But I really had a big misunderstanding of the gospel. It's not only for our salvation, but it's for our growth as believers. We need the gospel every day. As Luana said, we're forgetful people. We're so quick to forget. And we try to turn to our own ways of living the Christian life. Um, can everyone hear me okay, by the way? Okay. So uh, 1 Peter 2 says, we are to grow up into our salvation. And we can do that, one of the ways we do that is by growing in our understanding of the gospel and who God is and who he has made us in him once we are saved and we become his children. So how do we grow up in our salvation? How do we grow in this? How do we, how do, we do new things in general? Well, we have to learn. We're taught by instruction, by example, by practicing and following and trying it out. We have to be taught. So we're going to focus today on how we can grow in this together, grow in the gospel as disciples of Jesus, and how we can help each other do that through the relationships that we cultivate with one another. So the Bible uses the word disciple to describe someone who follows after the life and teaching of Jesus. Um, I want to read Matthew 28. This is the Great Commission, verses 19 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So this was Jesus' command to his disciples, and it applies to all believers then and now. Um, so first from this passage, we see that disciples are to make more disciples. We are to go into the lost world and tell them the message of Jesus so that they, hopefully, we pray people will trust him and have faith and become believers. So the first part is we're to make more disciples. The second thing it talks about is baptizing these new disciples. And the third thing is that disciples are to teach the other disciples to follow and obey Jesus. And the words, and then the cycle starts over again. So there's this repeating cycle. So we're going to focus on the last part, the third part there in verse 20, about teaching other disciples to observe all that Jesus commanded. That's kind of the words that use there. Now, we're never done learning, right? Especially, we're never done learning to imitate Jesus. We all, as much as we grow and we learn and we see progress, there's always more to know and more ways we can learn of him and grow to be more like him. So part of being a disciple is continually growing in our understanding of the gospel and of who Jesus is and the gospel that saved us. And we're slowly transformed into his likeness and it's for his glory. And as believers, we're called to learn these things and to teach other believers to do the same. So this is where the idea of discipleship comes from. Um, Melissa Kruger, I don't know if you've heard of her, she defines discipleship as relationships that focus on equipping younger believers for the work of ministry, so they grow in maturity and unity in the faith with the ultimate goal of glorifying God. Now, I don't know what the word discipleship brings up in your mind, but I perceive a bit of apprehension and caution and maybe misunderstanding um, around that word. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. That'd be great. 
<laughs> but maybe there's some fear, some hesitancy, or just not even understanding what that really means. If you've heard the word discipleship, discipleship or discipleship mentoring or things like that. So first I want to say, we see it clearly commanded in scripture, but I want to remind you that God's commands shouldn't be a cause of fear for us. Like on the contrary, God's commands should be bring life and joy. And, you know, first John says his commands are not burdensome. So regardless of what your background is or your preconceived notions, let's try to think of this as a beautiful thing that God has commanded for our good and for his glory. When we think about making disciples, um, so there's no biblical definition of discipleship, but there are patterns of it that we see in scripture. So another way we could describe a disciple of Jesus is someone who's growing in their knowledge, love, faith, and obedience to God. And doesn't stop there though, who encourage others and equip others to grow in the same ways and then to go and do the same and teach others. So Deuteronomy 6, uh, 5 through 9, I'm going to read that as well. I love these verses. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now that feels like a little bit of exaggeration almost, right? do it here and here and here. And when you lie down and when you rise up and put them on your forehead and put them on your doors, there's a little bit of exaggeration there. But I think the point is that we remember that this is supposed to be all of the time. Like our lives should be infused with this teaching others diligently about God and what he has commanded and who he is. So this was written to the Israelites, but it wasn't just for their feast days. They had big feasts and worship, you know, specific ways of worship. And it wasn't just for that, but it was to be ingrained in all the activity of their daily lives. So that applies to us. We should be remembering God's truth and who he is and who we are in Christ and teaching others to love and obey him in all the comings and goings of our daily lives, not just on Sunday morning or Friday night or at a prayer meeting, but all the time. Now, this is what we mean by life on life. You know, our, our title for today was life on life. That's kind of what we mean by that, living life together and doing these things. Now, does that mean we can only talk about the Bible and only talk about God all the time and only be spouting out scripture all the time? Well, not exactly because there are other things in life that need to be talked about and there's other things. But life on life means we're sharing life together. And in that, we see each other's lives that's where we get to know each other and each other's stories. And we know how to pray for and encourage each other. I won't know how to do those things if I'm not living life with you, right? And it's how we can gain insight into each other's tendencies and thought patterns and strengths and weaknesses, the good, the bad, the ugly, all the in-between. And we can see where we need to remind each other of gospel truth. Like, it's living in a way that brings God's truth to bear on all the daily happenings of our lives. So even if we're talking about other things, like we've all talked so much about baby, the baby coming, the baby that's coming, right? It's so exciting, the baby coming. But we can also, we can also bring God's truth to bear on those things. It's the perspective we bring. And so in everything we're talking about, we can be encouraging each other, okay? Some examples in scripture, you have Moses. He discipled Joshua in, in kind of probably an intense way, a very one-on-one -on -one way, because Joshua would lead him, lead the people of Israel after Moses died. But it wasn't a program. It wasn't a curriculum. It was life on life. They ministered and served together. They worshiped and sacrificed. They battled and they taught the people together. And he instructed and encouraged Joshua to prepare him for the ministry that was coming. Jesus is a huge example. We know he had his 12 disciples that he was with. And that, that was a great example of life on life, right? Like they did everything together. They were always together and fishing and doing all kinds of things. Um, in the book of Acts, which comes right after the Great Commission, Jesus gave that Great Commission we read in Matthew, and then he ascended. And then you have the book of Acts, which happens next. Um, that's where we see the story of the first church obeying and living out that command to make disciples. Acts gives us the ins and the outs, the mess and the beauty, the conflict and resolution, 
it was there was no hiding the mess of what was going on there but there was such glory in it such victory and people came to know jesus and the churches were built and so that's a great example of that of life on life happening um paul said to timothy you then my child be strengthened by the grace that is in christ jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So we definitely see this pattern in scripture. Titus 2, we'll read it later, but we know that's the passage that talks about older women teaching the younger. So we have the pattern all over scripture. And this is a culture we want to cultivate in our church. Everyone grows up. We have so many cultures represented here today. And we have different backgrounds and we've learned things that describe and define us and affect the way that we think and behave and they become natural. It's just part of who we are, right? It's natural. You don't have to think about it. Well, we want to, that, we want to have a culture in our church of disciple making where it becomes natural and we can put aside some of the things from our own culture that might not help with that and create this new biblical culture of creating disciples and encouraging one another in the gospel and letting that be just who we are so that we can help each other grow in their walk with the Lord. So, but we have to cultivate that. That takes work. It's not going to happen overnight. Now, discipleship is primarily the work of the local church. That's the pattern we see in scripture. So it starts in the local church and it's primarily the work of the local church. So it's what we do on Sunday mornings in the worship. And when we hear the word read and preached, and it's when we sing, when we gather for midweek meetings to study and share, it's when we use our gifts to glorify God and serve each other. It happens in our witness to the world around us, either corporately as a church and even individually when we're reaching out to people. And it's through relationships and accountability that we have. And these things are happening here. Like I see us growing together in these ways. Like you're all here today. Like that's huge just to be here, like being present at church functions and gatherings and I hear people asking really good questions and encouraging and praying together and giving prayer requests and this and pointing to their to Jesus. And this is this is part of it. This is where it begins. And so it's really exciting to see these things. But we want to keep cultivating these things. Um, so I want to look at Ephesians 4. And you have that there. And this is one of the main texts. And if you if you look back at the definition from Melissa Kruger, she actually uses some of the words from this passage that I'm going to read. It's kind of where she got her definition. So I'm just going to read through this. And then we'll see how this, like I'm saying, this is primarily the work of the local church. So starting in verse 11, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every new wind of teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Now, a common misconception about church life, I think, is that all the ministering is the responsibility of the leaders, the few who are up front. But the reality is it's only a very few who are called to be the pastors and leading worship and teaching formally and up front. But what about all the rest of us? It's not just for us to attend and listen and be passive. There's an active part there. So verse 11 and 12 in that passage talks about the leaders there, you know, the apostles, the evangelists, the pa- the preachers, the teachers. But then verse 12 says what their responsibility is. Let's look back at it. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church. Well, that's the rest of us. So the leader's job is to equip the rest of us to minister to each other and to be building up the church. So we all have a part to play. And I don't think I came up with this, but I call it every member ministry. Everyone who's here has a ministry job. It might not be the upfront, it might not be the one that gets the glory or the one who's singing or teaching or preaching, but we all have a part to play. And I love it, that last verse there says, as each part 
does its own special work. It helps the body grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And that's a beautiful picture when, when it's happening. So these verses were written to a local church body, the Ephesian church, and they're meant to be lived out in that context through a local church primarily. So not only is there proximity and natural overlap because we're doing church together, but there's a common authority, leadership, theology, and accountability that we have as part of the same local church. We're all being taught and shepherded by the same leaders. And we're all under their authority. And that's really important as we think about growing in our understanding of the Bible and who God is and as we dig into those things. So where it's not meant to be primarily happening is through online resources or mainly with people or programs outside the local church. Now, I'm not saying we can't do those things. Those absolutely can be great sources of encouragement and teaching, but they just shouldn't be the priority where we put most of our time for discipleship relationships. Um, that also doesn't mean we should create a bubble and insulate ourselves from everyone else. But the, the point is we should seek to be equipped primarily through our local church for the purpose of building each other up and going out into all of our other circles mm -hmm. and making an impact for Jesus. I hope that makes sense. Now, We've lived in many different places with lots of different believers in different churches with all the moving we've done. And I don't still look to those relationships as my primary relationships naturally because I'm not with them anymore. But I look to you like you guys are my church family. You guys are the ones that I look to. You're my body now. Oh, that's weird. It's not creepy. You're my body. Like we're one body. Okay. And so I want to pour into you and I want you to pour into me. Like I need you to pour into me life on life so we can grow together in whatever messy ways we can make it happen. But if we make it a priority and we commit to obedience to what God has commanded, we can make it happen. It doesn't have to be pretty and perfect all the time. It's not going to be. But proximity and being part of a local church together means we get to see each other live life and live out our faith in different ways. Like you can see on a Sunday, or if you see me even in the shopping center, but on a Sunday, you can see how I might have to discipline my children. You can see how maybe I'm loving and sacrificing for them, but you also will see when I'm harsh with them and when I'm impatient with them and where I need to be admonished to be more gentle right? You can see those things when we're in proximity together. Um, and I want you to come in and see the mess of my life. Sometimes I don't feel that way, <laughs> but I know it's the right thing. I want you to come in and see the mess of my life because that's where you'll see where I need to trust Jesus more and where I need to be reminded of the gospel. And you can come alongside me and encourage me and I can do the same for you. So we obey the command to make disciples by working to build each other up in close proximity and prioritizing our growth together as a local body of Christ. Now, you may feel afraid or unqualified for this. You may feel like, I don't know enough of the Bible or I'm a new Christian or I haven't been part of a church for very long and I've made mistakes and my sin disqualifies me. I don't know what the thoughts are going in your head. Could be some of those. Maybe you feel like you're ready, let's go. Great. <laughs> But it's true. We are unable to do this on our own. We are weak. We are sinful. But it doesn't disqualify us. Remember, Jesus was speaking to sinners when he gave that. He was speaking to his disciples who were kind of a mess, right? They were a big mess. <laughs> and, he, and after he left, they, they kind of got themselves a little more together, but they were still a mess, right? So a quote I heard recently said, it's not about the size of your faith, but the object of your faith. And that's Jesus. It's not about what you know, the knowledge. It's about who you know, which is Jesus. Okay. And in the verses that I read, the Great Commission, he says he'll be with us always. He's with us, helping us and changing us. So uh, we don't have to be afraid. And a few other verses I'm going to read just to remind you of how equipped you are. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And for 2 Peter 1, 3 is one of my favorite verses. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him 
who called us to his own glory and excellence. So if you are a believer, if you are in Christ, you are fit to do this and you are called to do this. And one of the ways we do that is by engaging in intentional, deliberate, and mutually encouraging relationships and being present and committed to your local church, our local church. So I want to talk about some of the characteristics of disciple making. The first one, and this came as a relief to me, look at it as an identity, not an activity. Okay? This is an identity. It's what we do because of who we are in Christ. It's not a program or an activity or something you have to add on to your already very busy lives. Okay? It's the way we interact with others in relationship because of our new life in Christ. We love because he first loved us. Um, I'm going to read Titus 2 there now. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. I want you to notice here, Paul talks about their character first before he talks about what's being taught. Okay, they were sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and love, steadfastness, reverend, not slanderers. It's out of their identity in Christ. They've been transformed by Jesus, and it's out of that transformation they are to go and teach others. So remember, it's an identity, not an activity first. Um, I want you to think about water lines, pipelines. In Ireland, they're horrible, right? As we've been told. Hopefully this won't break down my analogy. But pipelines are put in place for the purpose of getting water from the source somewhere, goes on the pipe to its intended destination. Well, we can think of discipleship like that, discipling. We are pipelines. We are the pipelines for God's grace and truth to move from the source, which is God, and then through us to other people, which is each other. Okay, so you can think of it that way. Um, Colossians 3 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I'm not going to sing, don't worry. But we want the word of Christ to dwell in us and to fill us up and so that it overflows and goes as a pipeline to to those around us, okay? So Christians who are rooted in God's word and truth are in a position to do good to others by walking in God's truth, learning to live by it, and passing it on to others, okay? It's a lifestyle of pursuing one another. And now when you're doing that, it's naturally going to result in things that you plan and schedule and add into your life like we're here today, right? But that's not what makes us disciple makers. It's not something we master and move on from. It's a lifelong process that happens because Christ is changing our hearts. And then we do that together and we grow together. So identity, not activity. Um, the next point is it has to be intentional and deliberate. So at its core, I would say discipling is essentially whatever we do to intentionally help other Christians grow in holiness and their love for God. So anytime we're doing that, that's discipling. I want you to think about a boat on the sea. If there's a boat and it's drifting along, how likely is it to get to where it wants to go if it's drifting? Not very likely, right? That's why boats have rudders and steering wheels, because <laughs> they're not just going to get where they want to go. If they're drifting, you end up way off course, right? Because the reality is things don't drift toward completion, order, and goodness. Just put kids in a room and you see it does not drift toward order and goodness and completion. It drifts the opposite way, right? <laughs> so we don't drift toward holiness and righteousness. Yes, our hearts are new and God is working in us to change us. But there's a reason we're told to be diligent to grow up into our salvation. So when someone comes to faith, we know the work of the gospel and the Holy Spirit will change and transform them over time. Because God says he will complete the good work he started in each of us, right? But we can't just drift along without putting any thought or intentionality into our relationships or our spiritual growth and then expect to find ourselves growing in faith 
and loving each other well and building each other up. Philippians 2 says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will. Wait, I'm trying to quote it and I'm messing up here. God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So it's God's work in us, but we're also commanded to be intentional in the working out of our own salvation. So we have to be intentional. Hebrews 10, 24 says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So what does consider mean? Let's consider what consider means. It means to think about, to ponder, to strategize. We're told to deliberately work for the purpose of spurring each other up in love and good works and growth as believers. So the fact that scripture tells us we have to be intentional to figure out how to stir each other up implies it's not going to happen without intentionality. So a crucial aspect of discipleship is intentionality as we cultivate and cheer on what God is already doing in our hearts. Um, and that kind of ties in with the next one. Growing and building each other up is only going to happen by the power of the Holy Spirit and through prayer. We can't expect to do this by our own strength, our own ability, our knowledge, but we must rely on the Spirit's work in each of us. So I'm not responsible for the work of the gospel in someone's life, but I can help cultivate it as I point people back to Jesus and pray for them along the way. So in discipling each other, we don't want to be dependent on ourselves and we don't want someone to become more dependent on us than they are on God, okay? It's important to remember our limitations. We need to trust God because relationships are messy and because we're sinners, right? We don't have all the answers, but we know how to find them. We know the one who does, and we have his word. So remember, we're just the pipelines. God is the source. It's his work. We're just the pipelines, okay? So avoid putting expectations on yourself and on each other, but do put expectations on God. He's working powerfully in all of our hearts and pray for him to help us. I find that a huge relief because it all feels too big for me. Um, and I'm going to sin against you. <laughs> I probably have already. I'm going to let you down. I'm going to disappoint you. But in that, we can give each other grace and trust God to keep working because he's the one. So we have to trust the Lord when you feel unqualified and when you feel like nothing's changing or you feel like I failed you or you failed me. But remember, this is not about us doing a work in someone's life. It's about the gospel working in your life. It's not about perfection. It's about growing together in the gospel. So we're simply tools in God's hands to cheer each other on on the journey. And we trust him to work through us for each other's good because it's ultimately his work in each of us. And we must pray, 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 and pray some more. <laughs> pray for God's help to do this and pray for each other. Be committed to praying for each other. I have an app on my phone that I keep track of people I want to pray for and prayer for, and every single one of your names is on it. And I pray through, and it helps me cycle through. And I, I've printed it out so that I have it by my desk, and so I see your names frequently, and I remember you, and and I can pray for you, even if it's just a little short, quick prayer. I can pray for you guys. And so we want to pray for each other and pray for God to help us do this. Um, the next thing is that it needs to be rooted ultimately in God's word. So we start becoming disciple makers by treasuring God's word personally. We need to make it a priority to be digging into God's word, studying, memorizing, meditating, reading, so that it fills us and changes us. Because discipleship is not about our advice, our experiences, or our wisdom, although those can be helpful, but it must be based on God's truth and what he reveals about himself and who we are in him. God's word, we know, is what brings heart change and what brings life. Hebrews 4 says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates and judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And 2 Timothy 3 says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. It's perfect for everything we need. God's given us everything we need in his word, and that needs to be the foundation for how we encourage each other. And Psalm 119, 130, I love this verse. It says, The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. 
That's us. We're the simple ones. <laughs> we need his light to shine on our hearts through his word and allow that to form the basis for how we encourage each other. Um, this is the last one we'll talk about for now. Um, it focuses on making followers of Jesus. So growing the gospel is not just about moral change or behavior modification. It's not just to help you feel good about yourself, not to help you tick off a box or just feel good because you have positive change in your life. That's a big thing in the world right now, right? Positive change. That's not what this is about. It's about you loving Jesus more and helping others around you do the same. My goal is not to make you look more like me. <laughs> it's to make you look more like Jesus. Please don't start looking more like me. It's not about getting someone to agree with you or have the same opinion or even the same convictions from thing in, things in the Bible. That's not the main goal. We're going to have different convictions, but it's about helping each other find out what God says about things through his word and pointing back to that. So we want to emphasize the work of the gospel in each other's lives, not my work in your life. And so it's about helping each other grow in Christ likeness and knowing how to trust and obey him more in their day to day life. And I remember the first definition I said, the primary word there was that it's relationships. I'm going to talk more about that. But as we talk about this, I should have said this. Think about this in relationship with each other, not just on Sunday mornings, not just in formal church times, but in relationships with each other. These are the things we want to be thinking about, being intentional and how it's just who we are in Christ, rooted in God's word and trusting him to do the work and helping others look more like Jesus. Um, so if you notice in your books there, the net, if you were following along, Hopefully I wasn't going too fast. There's a discussion part one is what you have there. So what we're going to do is we're going to break into some small groups now. And we have some discussion questions that we can talk through together. And then we'll come later and do another talk and have more discussion. So we'll break it up like that. So um, maybe I can just pray as we close this time. And then Luana will give us some instructions. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word and for how we can learn to follow you and love you and obey you and teach others to do the same. And I pray that you would use these words, God, to convict us and encourage us and spur us on and just help us know how we can do this, God, and how we can obey these commands. And I pray now as we uh, break up into small groups and talk about these things, that we would be honest and open and um, really just dig into what we're feeling about these things and what your word says, and that we would uh, just even now grow and, and encourage each other in the gospel. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.